Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, good afternoon um, and welcome to Share, Sharing Geoscience Online, um, this year's virtual annual meeting of the European Geosciences Union. Um, this year, we have more than 18,000 abstracts um, and have already had more than 19,000 unique users from around the world participating in our events. I'm Terry Cook. Um, I'm EGU's Head of Media Communications and Outreach, and I'll be hosting this week's press conferences, um, and that will include a question and answer period um, following the presentations of today's four speakers. This is the first time we've ever tried uh, completely remote press conferences before, and so we may experience some technical difficulties. If the platform suddenly quits during the middle of the press conference, I'll restart it and give everyone about five minutes to rejoin the session. Um, and if I'm not able to do that because of internet problems, then we will finish the recording and still post it to EGU's um, YouTube video page. Also, the transitions sometimes are a little bit slow, um, and so I ask for your patience while we test this new greener way um, of holding geoscience press briefings. Journalists, um, after the speakers have finished um, and you want to ask questions, please only use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask them. Um, do not use the chat or the hand raising function. Um, also wanted to let you know that the abstracts and other documents relating to the press conferences are uploaded to the document section of the media website, and that's media.egu.eu. And so please check there for more information. I'm going to introduce all four panelists now um, to make for faster transitions. And this press conference is titled Journey to the Center of the Earth, and it's motivated by Jules Verne's classic novel. In it, the characters take an amazing trip through the planet's interior, where they witness battling prehistoric creatures and have many more adventures before returning to the surface via an eruption of Italy's Stromboli volcano, which erupted again last year. So the speakers who will take us on an equally exciting journey today are Malcolm Hart, who's an emeritus professor in the School of Geography, Earth, and Environmental Sciences at the University of Plymouth. Anne Duval, the CNRS Research Director at the University of Paris, Saclay. Paola Kohlemeyer, Royal Society University Research Fellow um, in the Department of Earth Sciences at Royal Holloway University of London. And Filippo Zanzaboni, Senior Assistant Professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Bologna. So I'll now hand things over to them. And then at the end, I will open up the floor for questions um, after everyone has finished presenting. Thanks so much. Right, am I live with everyone? Yes, you are. We can see your screen, thank you. Okay, um, as uh, Terry indicated, I'm an emeritus professor, which means I retired about 10 years ago. And my research in particular is micropaleontology, which of course, is not really what this presentation is about. Um, I've worked in all parts of the world uh, and done some strange things with microfossils, like uh, direct the route of the building of the Channel Tunnel between England and France, which is not something you normally associate with microfossils. But about 20 years ago, a group of us got together to try and establish a World Heritage Site on the Dorset Coast. And this is now recognized as, by UNESCO, as a World Heritage Site with outstanding universal value. And part of that universal value is that it records about 185 million years of Earth history along a 100 mile coastline. It's a place where lots of signs began, and in particular, it records a detailed record of Mesozoic life on Earth. And ever since the days of Mary Anning, back in about 1810, collectors, scientists, geologists of all nationalities have been finding fossils in that coastline. And many of these would come under the geological title of Lagerstätten, in other words, exceptional preservation. And you can see um, why just looking at that first picture, somebody who works on microfossils would get excited at the sort of quality of preservation of that particular squid-like cephalopod. The reason why I got involved was that 
all along the coastline we process samples for microfossils and we find all these hooks and for many years we really didn't know where these hooks were coming from but now we do and you can see in the bottom right hand corner there the arms of this squid are covered in paired hooks and this is clearly what the animal used to grasp its prey. Now, these squid are peculiar fossils. Um, they're soft bodied. So all we know is a very few records of the hooks and the ear bones, the bouncing organs that these things had so they could swim in the water. That's a completely different story. But what we've been looking at is uh, this area around Lyme Regis. Um, it's really interesting uh, that Mary Anning, who's pictured there, um, collected fossils from these cliffs. And of course, in the area near Church Cliffs, in the area with the red box, they excavated. And the trouble is, the cliffs are now falling down largely because of the excavations, but we can't blame Mary Anning for that. But these are just some of the exceptional preservation of fossils that we find. And in the middle of that top specimen and also in the lower one, you can actually see the ink sac because these animals had ink sacs like modern octopus and that was a defense mechanism. And you can still see the black ink within that specimen. Now, this specimen, um, was found last year. And of course, one of the problems we have in a World Heritage Site is fossil collecting. And it's supposed to be monitored, it's supposed to be not controlled, but we have to be very careful that people just don't take parts of the World Heritage Site away. Of course, the main thing is that because it's a coastline, what we find is that what might be in the cliff today after a bad night's weather could be in the sea and some people would argue that collecting the fossils actually does science a service but this specimen has been hidden away um, but i've managed to persuade my co-author that really um, the beautiful preservation of the arms and the jaw mechanism and the hooks in the arms is something really quite exciting. And then we found this specimen. This specimen has been, I think, buried in a drawer since 1879. To the left, you can see the ink sac, but to the right, in the top part of the diagram, you can see the presence of a fish by the scales. And if you look at the bottom there, you can see the scales, you can see the fins, you can see the head area, and you can see by the lines of hooks that this fish is being held by the squid. And when we look at the head area, all the bones have been broken. Now, I know there is a cliff above the specimen, and therefore it could be compaction. But the answer is that these bones in the head of the fish have been literally sliced through. So this looks like a violent attack by this squid-like pre squid -like predator. And as such, it's one of the earliest paleobiological examples of a squid fish predation in the geological record. We do have older specimens, um, that are known from collections. And here's another one. It's geologically younger, but you can see there's a fish being held with its fins visible, um, but this is slightly younger. So the one that we've been describing in this paper is literally extending the record of squid fish predation right back through the geological record to the base of the Jurassic and this sort of paleobiology is what the World Heritage Site is really all about. 
and this is now being described. Uh, we can't do much chemistry with it because the earlier collectors often painted their specimens with preservatives or what they thought were preservatives, um, which of course does no good to modern geochemistry. Uh, so we literally have to look and not touch the specimen. But anyway, that is the specimen and it's part of a record of these interactions between some of the fossils that we find all along the Jurassic part of the World Heritage Site. Anyway, that is uh, the subject of this presentation and the paper that's going to be published in the next two or three weeks. Thank you very much. The next speaker will be Ann Deval. Okay. Hello. So I'm a physicist and I'm working on mantle convection using laboratory experiments. Oh. Sorry, I'm trying to get my slides moving. Yes, okay. So uh, the evolution of our planet is completely conditioned by its cooling. So it formed hot in a cold universe. And so the whole evolution is going to be uh, controlled by uh, motion in the most viscous envelope, the, the mantle, and by thermal convection. So for a long time, uh, since the early 30s, uh, the vision was that uh, you will have a large convective cells. As we got uh, more uh, observation, more data, this vision uh, has changed. So we know now that there is plate tectonics uh, with a number of plates that are moving uh, along each other and that the deformation is very localized on the plate boundaries. Then when we look at the internal structure that, for example, seismology is, uh, is giving us a lot of observation about that, we see that uh, the cold plates that are coming down in the mantle are delimiting two mantle domains that appear a lot hotter. And they've been named uh, LLSVPs, so large low velocity provinces. Uh, those two domains also host most of the hotspots uh, on Earth. And uh, when with the more recent uh, images by tomography, people have been able to uh, probe uh, those uh, um, uh, low velocity provinces, uh, it is seen that it's hosting a number of large features and uh, even that you can even say plumes, but those plumes are much fatter than uh, what had been proposed uh, by classical thermal convection. So there is a whole uh, lot of uh, new uh, data that we have to understand in the framework of uh, thermal convection in the mantle. Okay, so uh, what uh, we're going to do is uh, not to get uh, a miniature Earth in the laboratory, but really to look at the physics of the processes to be able to provide a quantitative framework to predict and interpret uh, the geological observation. So what we do in the laboratory is uh, to take typically a fish tank and uh, we're looking at convection, so hot heating from below, cooling from above. And this fish tank is filled with different fluids that have different flowing properties. So we can really isolate a, phenomenon, a convective phenomenon. We can control and characterize uh, all the boundary condition and all the motion inside uh, the tank. And so we have a good uh, data set on which we can get a real physical understanding and physical laws uh, to explain our observation. So what is varied uh, systematically are the fluid properties and also the boundary condition. So then with those physical laws, we are able to interpolate the result to the Earth's mantle. And so uh, for more than a century now, 
uh, people have, uh, have known that uh, the convective intensity and the convection patterns depend very strongly on the temperature gradient, so the that is going to get the, the buoyancy forces, uh, the, the engine of motion, and the fluid viscosity. So if you have a, a low in, uh, convective intensity, you're going to have mostly cellular convection. But when the convective intensity is large enough, so a large temperature gradient, low viscosity, like in the mantle, then you can get plumes, hot plumes, that are developing from the hot boundary, and you will have cold plumes from the cold boundary. So this is explaining really well how you could get hot spot from mantle plumes. But on the other end, it gives you only one type of morphology, and the plume conduits are predicted to be rather thin, more like uh, 200 kilometers. So this is at odds with what is observed. We do have plumes, but they seem to be fatter. And then this type of convection is not producing surface plate, and it's not producing either uh, two domains, uh, for example, as has been identified in the mantle. So in order to uh, explain more about plumes. In fact, if you remember that uh, the mantle contains a lot of heterogeneities in composition, so heterogeneities in density, then you can run experiments by, for example, introducing some salt to densify your fluids. So here it's uh, in orange. And then if you look at how plumes develop, you see that as the buoyancy ratio, which is the ratio of the chemical density contrast, which is stabilizing the flow over the thermal density contrast, is increasing, then you're going to change very drastically the shape of the plume from the mushroom, the classical mushroom shapes to much more contorted, even to pile, and so on. So with this kind of, uh, of phenomenon, you can explain, you can predict that there should be uh, several types of plumes that could occur in the mantle. And you can also explain why uh, plumes could be fatter, because uh, in those thermochemical plumes, you have very often recirculation within the conduit so, so, so that it, it gets thicker. So we can also uh, generalize this result by looking at uh, the full system, the full blown system of a whole mantle. Both, uh, in the lab or numerically. And then you predict that uh, you can coexist several types of plumes uh, once the mantle has started to convect uh, for a long time, because it will contain probably heterogeneities of, of different intensities. So uh, you can explain with this sort of modeling uh, how you could get several types of hotspots, several types of plumes, and LLSVPs. On the other end, it doesn't give you any reason why you should get plates. And then you have to invoke something else, which is uh, how the fluid is going to deform. If you take rocks, they have a viscosity that depends very strongly on temperature. They're much stiffer at colder temperature than at hot temperature. So it's going to introduce a very strong asymmetry between the hot current and the cold current in your convective box. So the pattern now is going to depend on the viscosity ratio between the hot material and the cold material. If you apply uh, the physical laws to the Earth's mantle, then you predict that you're going to have convection below one stagnant plate. So it's a good way to make a plate, but the problem is to break it. And so to break a plate, you need more complex fluid. In fact, you, uh, when you, we look at rocks, uh, <coughs> uh, we see that uh, uh, rocks can yield or break if the applied stress or force uh, under which they are is higher than a threshold. So um, if you get uh, this in a, in a everyday fluid, like for example, paint, and you use this type of colloidal uh, dispersion in our uh, fish tank system, uh, when you see convection, then you are forming a plate on the surface, but this plate now can break. And when it, break, it is breaking, you got one-sided one subduction as it is observed on Earth. 
You can get also a very strong interaction between plume and subduction, even uh, originate subduction uh, by plume. And you can observe also all the accretion phenomena get that uh, like um, microplates and transform faults overlappers that you see on Middle Ocean ridges. So uh, this uh, approach using uh, soft matter material, uh, especially complex fluid, uh, can be uh, very helpful to understand how the rheology, the, the way your fluid is deforming, is going to influence the convective regime of a planet. So we see uh, that there is a lot more convective regime than just plate tectonics or stagnant lead convection. So the, uh, we have a lot more to explore and uh, we have especially to understand how a system can transition from one regime to the other. And one of the key ingredients I think to understand now is to understand how the fluid texture and the way it deforms is going to influence the, de um, the convective pattern. Uh, there is uh, right now a really a lack in the theory and the lack in, in mathematical formula to describe this type of uh, deformation. And uh, to get a, a good uh, experimental database can really um, help to solve the problem. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. And the next speaker will be Paola Kolomeyer. Good afternoon, my name is Paula Kullemeyer and I'm a global seismologist. And um, it's a pleasure to speak to you today and talk about the landscapes of the deep earth uh, with you. Jules Verne already imagined all kinds of landscapes within the earth, deep earth during the journey of Professor Leidenbrook to the center of the earth. As you can read here in this description of the central ocean. And we may not have a sea at the center of the earth, as he imagined, but we certainly have landscapes within the earth. Just as on the earth's surface, as we can have mountains and valleys on internal boundaries, topography variations. But also, just like the soil and the vegetation are part of landscapes on the earth's surface, we can say that in the deep earth, the three-dimensional structures that we find here also form part of our landscapes. I have now found that particularly under Af Africa and the Central Pacific, there are two mountainous regions on top of the core that, have a few that are a few kilometers higher in elevation. And you can see these regions here in this three-dimensional uh, model of the core mantle boundary topography. Constraining this topography is important because it tells us about the flow of material in the earth. For example, when we have a downwelling cold um, plate, we expect this to depress a boundary, as you can see in this cartoon. But if we have upwelling hot material, we expect an elevated um, boundary. And the flow of th this, flow of this flow of material determines how heat is removed from our planet, which is ultimately important for a lot of dynamic processes, such as mantle convection and plate tectonics as well as um, the generation of the Earth's magnetic field, because it also extracts heat from the Earth's core. However, it's very difficult to see inside the Earth and to image these landscapes, because these structures are thousands of kilometers below our feet. Seismic waves that arise after earthquakes can act as our eyes and allow us to see um, these, these images, these landscapes. And it is as if the material in between is made out of glass. Of course, there are complications. So we are not looking entirely through transparent glass when we're trying to image these landscapes. But seismic waves still allow us to see um, the deep earth. Typically, we use um, waves traveling from through the earth after earthquakes that are reflecting and refracting around the core, um, which you can see here in these blue and red paths. However, they do not provide us with data everywhere and would lead only to patchy observations of these landscapes. Alternatively, we can use observations of the standing waves of the Earth that only arise after large magnitude earthquakes. And the resonance frequencies of these whole Earth oscillations are also affected by our landscapes. The measurements of these resonance frequencies 
automatically provide us with global data coverage. And there are a number of oscillations that are specifically sensitive to the core mantle boundary. By analyzing existing models um, from different groups based on these uh, standing wave data, I have uh, found that there are particularly two areas of elevated topography on the core, here under Africa and under the Pacific, which you can see in these red colors. And there's valleys or canyons in between um, under um, the Caribbean and underneath Indonesia. Specifically, these, uh, the locations of these mountains coincide with the locations of the large low velocity provinces or LLVPs, which are two giant blobs that are imaged in the seismic velocity structure of the lower mantle, which you can see here on the right. And um, you see these two red structures. Although these are imaged very consistently between different tomographic models, we don't have unique interpretations what causes these low seismic velocities whether this is due to high temperatures or um, whether these have um, chemical, uh, strong chemical variations. Strong constraints are provided by the density structure, which you can now see on the right hand side. And again, by analyzing existing models, I have found that the dense parts of these, um, of these LVPs seem to be localized in two smaller scale regions, roughly centered below Angola and close to Hawaii. And specifically, when you compare this with the topography, which you can see on, on the left-hand side, we see that where we have these dense areas, we have less elevated topography. And it is as if these dense areas are surrounded by a ring of higher, um, stronger elevation of, in the core topography. These observations tell us that these giant structures, these, L, these LLLVPs, underneath the Pacific and underneath Africa. And here you can see a rendering of the one underneath Africa showing its vast extent. That these can't be entirely dense structures, but that the dense anomalies are limited to smaller areas within these structures. And that implies that there's a balance between the thermal and the chemical variations um, leading, which leads to these small dense areas. At the same time, the elevated topography suggests that upward flow occurs at these locations, which is important to constrain further, as these giant structures influence the way the Earth cools down and loses heat over time. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions later. Thank you so much. We'll end our journey, um, returning back to the surface of the Earth um, with Filippo. All right. <clears throat> okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, let me thank Terry for this opportunity to share uh, my research. We are at the end of this journey, really. <laughs> and uh, I am like an end user because, uh, yes, what we will speak about is the, the effects of the eruptions. Uh, first of all, I am uh, I am a researcher at the University of Bologna, just to present myself quickly, and uh, my research activity deals with the numerical models of landslides and tsunamis. So what I am going to show you uh, is uh, some preliminary results coming from this analysis we did on, uh, on uh, mass failures occurring in Stromboli Island. As you can see, I think you, 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 you know very well Stromboli. It is a volcanic island and uh, mm, it is frequently uh, affected mass by, by mm, mass, fail mass failures. There are collapses along its flanks. These collapses are provoked by many aspects of uh, volcanic activity and uh, occasionally they can generate tsunamis uh, and tsunamis can be uh, also catastrophic, especially in local uh, uh, scale. So what we did in this work and what I we'll try to, to show you is uh, um, some simple relation that wants to link the landslide and the tsunami that is generated by them. And this uh, simple relation that can also be used for the hazard management. We are still in the, okay, in the beginning phase, so we are still far from this application, but it, at least we are trying to, 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 to look for some relation in this very, a complicated natural uh, uh, phenomena. So, 
two words about Stromboli. Uh, it's a volcanic island, as I told you, is uh, located in the Tyrrhenian Sea. It is a very peculiar uh, volcanic uh, um, activity that is characterized by frequent uh, eruptions and also occasionally extreme events like the one in uh, last summer. Uh, from the um, landslide collapse point of view, what is main uh, interesting from our side is the big scar on the northwest flank of the volcano. is a, a scar that was generated by a, an ancient collapse of the volcanic edifice, and most of the material that goes out from the craters is channeled to the sea, to the sea along this scar. So most of the slides occur along this Shear del Fuoco. In the catalogs, there are 10 tsunamis that are reported in the last 155, uh, 150 years in the Aeolian archipelago. The most recent, as I told you, is the, uh, the last summer, and another one was in 2002, uh, that provoked a wa waves of uh, 10 meters elevation all around the island. So they were very big effects. The strategy of this presentation of our work that we are doing, we are doing modeling. So we start from landslide scenarios. We depict uh, 61 different uh, cases of landslides along the Sierra del Fuoco. We perform the tsunami simulation generated by these landslides, and then we look for the correlation between the two phenomena, trying to describe uh, the landslides and the tsunami with some typical main parameters that can in some way describe them. For example, for landslide, usually the, the question is, what is uh, its volume? How deep is it? So we can also look for different characteristics of the slide and also for the tsunami usually the most important the most uh, searched one is the maximum water eight and then we try to look for some correlation about these quantities and um, and i will show you some uh, plots uh, first of all the scenarios uh, just two words on the world scenarios scenarios here means that we are doing uh, uh, hypothetical landslides. These are not the simulation of what occurred, or at least they are not only them. In fact, for example, scenarios B, C, and D are based on the 2002 uh, events. We vary the volume of the landslides from a very small, half million cubic meter, to the big one, that is the F scenario here, that is the one that generated the, the Sierra del Fuoco. So we try to, to keep into, to take into consideration a, a lot, a, a, a wide range of possible landslide along the Sierra del Fuoco. So this is an example, just one, and I don't want to go too much in the details of the technical issues about this, but an example of the plots that we can uh, obtain is this one. On the horizontal axis, we have the potential energy of the slide. On the vertical, there is the maximum water elevation that we are simulating and measuring on one single tide gauge. The tide gauge you can see here from the arrow is located in two kilometers northeast of Stromboli. So how can we use this plot like this? For example, if we know that we have a potential slide, we can try to imagine what is its potential energy. So we go in the horizontal axis and crossing one of these lines, I don't know again <laughs> in the details of what we did, uh, why there are two lines. We can imagine what is the maximum water elevation in that uh, uh, specific location. There are, as I told, the other uh, relevant uh, uh, characteristics of the tsunamis, the, the maximum uh, energy, the total energy of the tsunami, other more physical quantities. But from the practical point of view, this can be interesting because we can in some way try to assess what is the effect of a slide in terms of maximum water elevation over uh, one single point. This is a similar plot, but it, is, uh, it represents the computation of and, and the same uh, linear relation that I showed before, but in another uh, tight gauge. So, uh, it is a simulation in a um, in a more distant tide gauge, it is in on, on the, along the Calabrian coast. And uh, what is uh, surprising and also interesting for us is that the slope of these lines are the same as the previous one, are very similar. 
it is very promising because this is a linearity. Okay, we are in a log log scale, so it is not a direct uh, proportionality, but it is very interesting because tsunamis, uh, landslides lights are very common phenomenon to model. Finding these regularities is something that is very welcome. So I, we think that is very promising. Okay, that's all, and I wait for your question. Thank you very much. Okay. Do we have any questions? Okay, well, I, if there's no questions then, um, we'll finish here. And thank you everyone for joining us. I hope to see you all in person in Vienna uh, next year during EGU 2021, which will take place the last week of April. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>